Okay. Well, good morning. Uh, we'll go ahead and get started. I am pleased to report that Iowa's COVID-19 statewide virus activity remains stable and continues to show signs of further improvement since the holidays. Not surprisingly, we experienced an increase in positive cases following Christmas and New Year's gatherings, but they were minor, minor in comparison to other parts of the nation and far from the surge uh, that some predicted would occur. Over the 14-day period from December 20th to January 2nd, 88,371 Iowans were tested, of which 17,376 were positive for a positivity rate of 19.6%. From January 3rd to the 16th, testing increased significantly, with 55,000 more Iowans being tested during the previous two weeks, uh, but the statewide positivity rate dropped several points to 13.1%. Currently, Iowa's 14-day rolling average is 11.2%, and our seven-day uh, average is 8.4%. The number of Iowans hospitalized with COVID-19 has steadily decreased over the last few weeks. Uh, statewide, we have 474 individuals who are currently hospitalized, 86 are in ICUs, 74% of those hospital hospitalized are older adults aged 60 to over 80. As long as the virus rem remains active in our communities, we'll continue to see our case numbers and our positivity rate ebb and flow, uh, but this is not cause for an alarm. This type of regular fluctuation is to be expected and it's normal of any virus, but especially for a new virus that only a small percentage of the population is currently immune to. Our goal continues to be keeping virus activity at a level we can manage during the course of our daily lives, and I think we're demonstrating that we can do that. As, a va as vaccines continue to roll across the nation and our state over the coming months, uh, we're all happy to um, you know, see life hopefully begin to return to normal. Uh, with vaccines, I know that many Iowans are eager to be vaccinated and simply want to know when it will be their turn. Today, I wanna to provide some additional context and clarity on that topic so that Iowans can feel more assured about when and how vaccines will be administered across the state and why it is really necessary to prioritize and to pace the rollout. Here in Iowa, I am proud of the progress that we're making. We're doing a lot with relatively little vaccine. Iowa ranks 46th nationally, 46th nationally in the amount of doses allocated to our state uh, near the very bottom of the list. In, and in fact, we are currently receiving only 19,500 doses of vaccine each week. However, when it comes to administering those doses, we're near the top of the list, ranking 15th in the country. As soon as our weekly vaccine allocation is received, it's going out the door and into the arms of Iowans across the state. According to our latest numbers that we're up that were updated just this morning, we've now received more than 160,000 first doses of vaccine and have administered more than 106,000 of them primarily to Iowa's healthcare workforce. As of yesterday, 82% of the total first doses uh, that we've been allocated by the federal government has been used to protect those who've been providing care for Iowans since the beginning of the pandemic. Yesterday, we received another shipment and it's already being administered today. And more than 22,000 healthcare workers have now received their second dose and are fully vaccinated. Unfortunately, like many other states, the vaccine, vaccination program run by the federal government and our national pharmacy partners for residents and staff of the state's nearly 450 long-term care facilities has been slower than anticipated. Nearly 116,000 doses, and that's in addition to the 19,500 that the state receives, has been allocated to this program. And I will say that significant progress has been made in the last two weeks. We've been assured by the providers that first doses will be completed statewide uh, by the end of the month, and we continue to monitor that daily. With the 1A vaccination phase well underway, uh, we believe that it's time to move into 1B and make the vaccine available to more Iowans. So this is good news, and it's an important step forward, but I want to be very clear 
This does not mean that we can open vaccination up to all Iowans or even that vaccine will be immediately available to all of the groups that have been prioritized in phase 1B. The national vaccine supply remains limited. Each state is being allocated uh, a weekly amount. And despite conflicting information that's been communicated over the last couple of weeks, states cannot place orders for additional vaccines. Our allocation is determined and distributed uh, at the federal level, and we rely on the numbers that they provide to plan our response and our approach. We anticipate that our weekly allocation could begin to increase starting the week of February 1st and each week following. But as I mentioned earlier, I want to just be clear that Iowa today is only receiving 19,500 doses a week. The Trump administration did project that our weekly statewide allocation would increase to 39,000 39, doses by the week of February 8th and could continue to increase by another 10,000 doses each consecutive week uh, through March 1st. But, you know, that could uh, now change as plans are introduced by the Biden administration. And we are working with the administration to see what that looks like and how we can plan accordingly. But allocations are always subject to change in demand for the vaccine, and demand for the vaccine will be much greater than the supply for some time. So as we begin to expand eligibility for vaccination and move into 1B, it will still be necessary to phase in specific groups over time, pacing it according, according to the number of doses um, were allocated each week. Recently, IDAC made its Phase 1B recommendations for Iowa, which uh, included prioritizing those age 75 and older, first responders, teachers, frontline essential workers, and others. Since then, there has been a push nationally to immediately prioritize older Americans who are most at risk for serious illness and hospitalization. It's been my goal to vaccinate as many Iowans as possible, as quickly and safely as possible. So while, prior, prior, while prioritizing those with higher risk, whether due to age or likelihood of exposure. And I know that that goal is shared by the Iowa Department of Public Health, local public health officials, and our health care providers alike. And it's what Iowans want too, along with more details on exactly when and how they will be vaccinated. So to make that happen, we are updating the 1B plan to further expand eligibility of older adults. Tier one specific priority groups to set expectations of how they'll be phased in over time and to clarify where and how the vaccine will be available for them. The Iowa Department of Public Health has engaged a variety of vaccine providers and other resources to assist in the expanded vaccination effort from local pharmacies and clinics to state and local strike teams that will uh, vaccinate essential workers on site at their place of employment. Doctor, uh, Director, I always call you doctor every time. Director Garcia will provide information about our vaccine partners and this targeted approach in just a few minutes. But first I wanna share a few more details about phase one, including the tiering of priority groups and the size and scope of these populations. So beginning February 1st, Iowans age 65 and older will be eligible for vaccination. And this accounts for more than 500,000 Iowans. In early February, Tier 1, which includes law enforcement and first responders, pre-K-12 teachers and staff, early childhood educators, and child care workers can, be, can begin vaccination at local pharmacies or clinics. And collectively, this tier accounts for approximately 130,000 Iowans. While we're excited to begin vaccinating a broader population of Iowans, we again need to emphasize that the demand for the vaccine will vastly exceed our supply. With our current allocation from the federal government of 39,000 per week beginning February 9th, this process is just gonna take time. Each subsequent tier will be phased in as soon as possible according to the availability of the vaccines and where they're at throughout uh, the state. Tier two will include front, frontline essential workers and individuals with disabilities living in, home, in a home setting, and that total approximately is 600,000 individuals. 
Tier three includes staff and individuals in congregate settings and also government officials and staff at the state capitol. And together, those, uh, those groups consist of nearly approximately 13,000 individuals. Tier four includes uh, 1,500 inspectors responsible for health, life, and safety. And tier five consists of approximately 13,000 staff incarcerated individuals in correctional facilities. So you can see that this is no small undertaking and it cannot emphasize enough that Iowans will need to be patient. Um, vaccines are coming and you know there's good ne news on the horizon, but it's just gonna take some time. Once we complete 1B, we will have vaccinated um, half of Iowa's eligible population. Um, but it will again require our weekly allocations continue at their projected volumes and any changes to allocation will impact the pace of vaccination and our ability to move to the next tier. Um, however, with additional vaccines expected to enter the market, as I alluded to, we're optimistic uh, that soon we'll be able to further expand access to more Iowans. And as I mentioned earlier, Earlier, an effort of this magnitude requires many partners and a variety of strategies to ensure every Iowan can be vaccinated. Here to talk more about how that's the state is working with vaccine providers and standing up additional uh, resources is Kelly Garcia, the Director of the Department of Human Services and the Director of the Iowa Department of Public Health. Kelly? Thank you, Governor. And thank you, Iowans, for your patience as we move through this process, which we know everyone wishes was a bit faster. This vaccine is the definition of a scarce resource. We continue to be in close contact with our federal partners at CDC, Health and Human Services, Operation Warp Speed regarding expected increases in vaccine allocation, as the governor mentioned. Iowa is still very much vaccinating individuals in phase 1A, which includes healthcare personnel, and residents of staff in long-term care facilities. Although the, de the demand for that supply is now waning, and so it's time to move to the next phase of distribution. As the governor mentioned, this next phase, 1B, now includes Iowans 65 and, old and over, as well as other high-risk populations. This next phase will begin receiving vaccinations no later than the week of February 1st, and we'll be updating the shortage order to provide some additional flexibility between now and then. The state's approach focuses on Iowans who are most vulnerable to exposure of COVID-19 or high risk for illness as the revolt, result of COVID-19 infection. Many in this group are Iowans who do not have an option to stay safely at home and have been vectors leading to the spread in community. For example, at DHS facilities, we have, we have six facilities, and one is our Woodward Resource Center. We have a number of employees there who live with individuals who work in meatpacking plants. And every time there's an outbreak at a meatpacking plant, we see that spread in our resource center. We are providing guidance to local public health to empower them to take into account what has been the most significant vector in their community. So our targeted approach really is to ensure we're stopping further spread as we ramp up to protect all Iowans from this virus. As the governor mentioned, we've created tiers within phase 1B to assist local public health as they work through this group. The demand for this phase is tremendous and our supply remains the constraint. <clears throat> These changes both allow for strategic use of this scarce resource while allowing local flexibility. We don't ever want supply sitting on shelves, but we want to continue to ensure thoughtful use of the vaccine that provides the greatest benefit to all Iowans. As we move into the next phase, more settings and locations for vaccination will become available. We're getting a lot of calls from Iowans who want the vaccine, and that's wonderful. We want as many Iowans to get vaccinated as possible. Please watch for local public health social media updates. Calling them is not the best way to receive information. They're getting a lot of calls right now, but social media is a more real-time update. Once we expand and grow in our ability to vaccinate more broadly, there will be a multi-pronged effort with a lot of partners at the table to administer the vaccine on a mass scale. 
What will that look like for average Iowans? Some may receive vaccines at their employer and employer-based clinics. Others may receive theirs through local health, public health, through their healthcare provider, through a pharmacy or other clinical settings that are equipped to handle screening and scheduling for vaccination efforts. We're also continuing partnerships across the state, working closely with pharmacies and employers who are going to be a key piece of our multi-pronged approach in the coming weeks. For example, we've been working closely with high V and are pleased to have them here. Aaron will be talking in just a moment about what their, their strategy will look like. But before I hand it over to Aaron, I'd like to thank our local partners who continue to be on the front lines of this response. Thank you, Kelly. Um, as you mentioned, the Iowa Department of Public Health is coordinating with regional and local pharmacies to ensure their readiness to, um, to vac vaccinate Iowans as we move into phase 1B. Hy-Vee and Medicap are among the pharmacies serving communities across the state that will be an important partner in vaccinating Iowans. Today, I'm really pleased uh, to welcome Aaron Weiss. He is the Executive Vice President of the Business Innovation and Chief Health Officer at Hy-Vee uh, to share with Iowans the role that Hy-Vee pharmacies will have played in phase 1A and how they are preparing to help expand access to more Iowans in the coming weeks and months. Aaron. Thank you, Governor. Um, thank you, Director Garcia. Thank you for allowing me to share on behalf of Hy-Vee and our more than 1,000 pharmacists who are serving patients not only here in Iowa, but across the eight Midwestern states. Our team of experts has been providing vaccines for many years, and we're honored to be able to assist in this public health crisis by immunizing those who want the COVID vaccine. We stand ready to provide vaccinations as soon as we receive them. We have 140 pharmacy locations in Iowa alone, many of which are in rural communities that may not have easy access to a hospital or a physician, so our pharmacists serve as a healthcare provider in those communities. Due to our connections in nearly every community in Iowa, we are able to quickly immunize people when the vaccine is available. Our goal is to go beyond any other retailer in the state. What we did in Dallas, Polk, and Lynn counties serves as a great example of this recently. Within 24 hours of receiving the vaccine, we were able to start vaccinating individuals who fit within the county's qualifications. In partnership with Dallas County Health Department, we began vaccinating the frontline health workers at two of our Hy-Vee pharmacies at the end of December and it distributed all the vaccines in just over 24 hours. Right after the first of the year, we partnered with the Polk County Health Department and Drake University's College of Pharmacy and Health Sciences to vaccinate those in the expanded healthcare worker group in Polk County. We started with four Hy-Vee pharmacy locations and a clinic at Drake University's Harkin Center. Just yesterday, we expanded to another five Des Moines Metro Hy-Vee pharmacy locations. And in Lynn and Johnson counties, we vaccinated frontline healthcare workers via our Cedar Rapids and Coralville pharmacies. We stand ready to administer in those, to those in phase 1B following the guidelines given to us by the federal, state, and local levels. Our vaccination distribution capabilities fit many formats and needs. We have nine high V Healthy U mobile units that can go on site to vaccinate nearly anywhere to provide convenience to patients in group settings. We are currently working with employers, especially those in critical manufacturing and in the essential workforce to plan for these on-site vaccination clinics. As vaccine availability increases, we plan to deploy these mobile clinics to other sites in our communities as well such as church parking lots and community centers. We have private vaccination rooms at our Hy-Vee pharmacy locations, as well as socially distanced waiting areas and resting spaces where people can sit during the 15 minute post vaccination observation period. We offer the ability to efficiently schedule vaccine appointments online. And for those who don't have an internet connection, they can call the pharmacy to schedule their appointment. Patients receive a second dose reminder as well to ensure that they receive their second dose as appropriate on the date that it's due. hy has been working very hard developing our plan to assist with the vaccination for COVID since early last summer. We have regular meetings with the CDC and their COVID vaccination team. We meet weekly with Director Garcia and her team to coordinate and collaborate with their excellent county public health departments in their planning. Our clinical team has been working diligently to educate and prepare our staff on the unique aspects of COVID vaccination process. 
and our digital team has been developing assets to make the screening, scheduling, and patient education process efficient and accessible. In addition to the COVID vaccine distribution, our hy pharmacies are offering COVID testing services by appointment, including the molecular PCR tests, rapid antigen tests, and just recently the rapid antibody testing. Our hy pharmacies are familiar and trusted by Iowans in the communities that we serve. We have convenient storefronts with consistent accessible hours and vaccinate on the evenings and the weekends. We've been offering pharmacy services in Iowa for over 50 years, which has led to strong, long-term relationships with our patients and our communities. And we have an unwavering commitment to public health, not just with our normal pharmacy services, but through the COVID testing and our experience vaccinating more than 600,000 people just this past fall with the flu. It's important to Hy-Vee that we're part of the solution to fight COVID-19. We look forward to working with our partners in public health to bring this much needed vaccine to our communities. Thank you, Governor Reynolds and Director Garcia for the opportunity to share Hy-Vee's readiness and for working with us on this important public health effort. Thank you. Thank you, Aaron. We greatly appreciate the partnership of uh, hy V as well as the other Iowa pharmacies to help make the vaccine accessible and convenient as we continue to expand eligible populations. And we really look forward uh, to working with you to get more Iowans vaccinated as soon as possible. So thank you very much. I appreciate your update. As uh, vaccination continues to expand and the number of Iowans are vaccinated and that increases, it's even more important to have a data dashboard to track our progress on a daily basis. A new vaccination dashboard will be added to coronavirus.iowa.gov next week uh, in which we will be providing more details on the dashboard um, next week to all of you. Finally, I'm pleased to announce that a new grant program uh, will be that will provide financial relief for restaurants and bars that were impacted during the pandemic. The Iowa Restaurant and Bar Relief Grant Program will, will provide $40 million in funding for businesses that experienced a decrease in gross sales during the second and third quarters of 2020 compared to the same time um, the previous year. The one-time grants are intended to assist with short-term cash flow and award uh, amounts up to 25,000 will be tiered based on the percent of lost sales. I want to take this opportunity to thank uh, Iowa Representative Lundgren and Losey for their work with the Iowa Economic Development Authority to really help create the program that is intended to help hard hit restaurants and bars in the communities across the state to help them recover, bring their employees back to work and to keep their doors open. The application period will begin Monday, February 1st at noon and will close on Monday, February 15th at 5 p.m. All applications submitted within that time will be considered for an award. And more information, including details about um, how to apply, will be released next week by um, the Iowa Economic Development Authority and posted at iowabusinessrecovery.com. Uh, so that more information on that is coming uh, next week as well. And with that, I will open it up for questions. What do you tell confused Iowans? I know of a 90-something-year-old woman in northwest Iowa who knows exactly when she's getting the vaccine, but a 90-something-year-old who lives in congregate setting in Des Moines has no idea. Why is, it, why is it not being applied equally across Iowa to people in similar situations? Well, so, okay, I've spent a lot of time talking about um, uh, supply is just really, um, we don't have a lot of vaccine coming in at this point. It's, it, we're getting 19,500 a day. Tier one was to uh, make sure that we took care of long-term care facilities, residents and staff, as well as our health care uh, fr front workers that have been on the front line since the beginning of the pandemic. And so hopefully with the process that we're laying out, there'll be a little bit more, uh, it'll help us um, really operationalize and help um, Iowans understand when they will be eligible, what that process looks like and give them some assurity of when they'll be eligible for um, the vaccine. But the request a way since Iowa got vaccines, why is it well, taking so long to tell Iowans when they're going to get it? 
Well, we're getting, I told you we're getting a limited amount of doses every week. And the first 1A was to vaccinate um, long-term care facilities, which we have no, no authority over that. That's being done by the federal partnership. And that's rolled out a little bit slower than we had anticipated. It just took some time. We, on a per capita basis have one of the larger numbers of nursing homes uh, in the in the country and so but in the last two weeks they've made significant progress and they've assured us that they will be complete with the first round by the end of January and at that point the 19,500 allocations that they get will roll into the state's allocation so that's a little bit more of a bump but you know we've worked with our um, with our hospitals, we've worked with our um, local public health departments as well as the state to allocate the um, the vaccine, the doses, and to get them administered as quickly as we can. And I indicated in my remarks they've done an incredible job of getting them vaccinated. It just we are restricted by the number of doses that are coming into the state. And so hopefully, working with the administration and with new vaccines coming on board, that allocation will continue to grow. And we'll just you know we'll continue to make sure that we're communicating with Iowans and helping them understand what that rollout looks like. And that can take place. Uh, Director Garcia talked about social media, local public health. Uh, hy V will play our partners and Medicap will play a role in that. So uh, we're working through it as quickly as we can and we're going to move to the next phase, but it's still going to take a while until we see our numbers um, uh, increase, uh, the number of doses increase. And that's just a reality. Because of that, when we get to February 1st and more people become eligible, but maybe there's, like you said, the supply might not yet meet it, how will Iowans know when they're not only eligible, but, and, and especially for those that don't hear from their employer that might be getting it from so, one of the other... So Persons 60, uh, beginning February 1st, persons age 65 and older will be eligible. Uh, and we are, you know, driving those through our local pharmacies, local public health, and our clinic partners. And we'll release more details on this. And so we'll, through the communication efforts, let them know where they go to sign up for that as they become eligible. We put together tier, uh, in addition to that, we have tier one, tier two, tier three, tier four, and tier five. And I kind of walk through what those who are in included in those various tiers. What we want to make sure, so that's kind of a guidance of how we can allocate the vaccine uh, depending on the doses that we get. But what we don't want, different counties will be at different levels. And so we don't want them wasting any of the vaccine and we want them to know that there will be some flexibility within those tiers when they're allocating the vaccine. So we'll continue to, uh, through the weekly press conferences, through social media, through our local public health, through our partners, uh, continue to update Iowans on what that timeline looks like, where we're at with the number of doses that Iowa is being allocated, and kind of what that timeline looks like and how we move through that. Governor, how did members? Iowa wind up with a disproportionately lower allocation of vaccines relative to population, especially with a an older population yeah. than a lot of other states. Did anybody in the former Trump administration give you all insight on that? Um, no, and we've asked. It's loosely, it's supposed to be based on population, and we've heard different um, uh, things that are being considered, considered when they're allocating the doses to um, the various states. I did have a conversation um, this morning with Congresswoman um, Axney to talk about you know, where we're ranked and what we're getting and what those tiers look like. And I have a call scheduled with the rest of the delegation as well. I was just able to get a hold of her this morning to have them look into that and make sure that we're not missing something and what they're actually basing that on, especially when you talk about our elderly population. We just, Iowa has an elderly population. And when you consider the number of uh, nursing homes, long-term care facilities and assisted living facilities that we have in the state and the vulnerable populations that those include, uh, I would hope that we could get our allocation bumped up a little bit. So we have, we've reached out um, to HHS and through our delegation to uh, see if we can get some answers on how we can get that bumped up. Quick Governor, follow up to that. How have your uh, conversations with the Biden administration gone? Who, who have you spoken with? Have you spoken well, with Well, my staff, they've been on the, they've spoke with the team, the transition team. Um, I think the delegation uh, and my team, I think they're, my staff, 
our their, their scheduling biweekly calls so that we can keep the communication going, especially as we, you know, roll out the vaccine so that they can understand where we're at, uh, especially what our numbers look like with the number that we're being allocated, how many has been administered, just so everybody's on the same page as we, you know, move through the process. But, you know, it's just, it's going to take some time. There's just not a lot of doses that are being allocated. Uh, and it's across the state. Every state is dealing with the same thing that we are. So this isn't anything that's unique to Iowans. I do, again, want to just, you know, give a shout out to the team. They are doing an incredible job of getting the doses administered that we have been allocated. So we are, they're doing a good job of getting those out. I have a question just kind of looking forward a bit on, on the vaccinations yeah. and, and a timing issue. Yeah. Um, would you expect that teachers and, and staff in schools would be vaccinated before the bill that, that has now been introduced, you know, that would uh, require well, in-class there... in class yeah. teaching for those who yeah. prefer it. Yeah. Do, do you think that that timing would be that they may be vaccinated before that requirement that teachers be in classrooms? You know, I don't know. I can't guarantee that because I don't yeah. know what we're going to get on doses and it's always subject to change. Right now it's 19,500. We're anticipating 39,000 by February 8th. But all of that is just so fluid right now. And there's been a lot, kind of Katie, your point, been a lot of miscommunication that's been happening even at the federal level. You can call and get more. You can use the second dose. There's just been a no, you can't. I mean, there's just been a lot of miscommunication. And I think as we start to work through that and start to take a look at the doses. But Dave, to your point, I mean, we've put them in tier one. So, you know, we want to we want to make that happen as soon as we can. So that's first responders, law enforcement, fire, emergency managers, uh, our, our educators, uh, PK through 12, and then, you know, daycare, child care uh, providers. That's an, a really important group, too, as we try to make sure that we get, you know, keep this economy cranking and keep the momentum moving in the right direction. So those are really critical components of that. So is there any way to, there's no way to assure that teachers can be vaccinated? No, because I, they can't insure me. I know yeah. I would love it if they yeah. could guarantee that I would get X amount and I would know that it was coming. So I think what they can see, though, what we're trying to do by putting this together is to let certain populations have some idea of when, you know, we anticipate based on the number of doses that are allocated to the state where we'd like to see them work in. And as you can see, that's a, that's a priority. In the meantime, we just need to do everything we can to safely and responsibly get the kids back in the classroom. And I think that we can do that. But, you know, we want to alleviate as many concerns as we can and barriers to that. But you know, there's a lot of examples on how you can do it safely and responsibly. And we're going to continue to focus on that. And, you know, there's a lot of CARES funding that are CARES funding. I think it's 345 million that's going out to school districts right now to help maybe with testing or to help with PPE or any of the, you know, the uh, cleaning uh, products so that they can continue to make sure that, you know, everybody's working in a safe environment. So I ask one quick follow up. Sure. Just do you, do you anticipate that? undocumented workers in meatpacking plants would be eligible we're, for vaccines. Yeah, we're going to them. work with our private partners and we're going to, you know, that's an, that's one of the critical components. That was a recommendation that we get into our ag and food processors and work with the employees of those um, various um, facilities and uh, get them vaccinated. We want to make sure that we keep that food supply chain uh, moving. Governor, Question what type of oversight is there to ensure the correct populations are getting vaccinated and the incorrect populations are not? Well, so that's going to be really hard. And I think we're trying to be, you know, that first we they put together IDAC. They meant put a lot of time and effort into making recommendations on how we should facilitate and move into 1B. I want to thank uh, Kelly and her team for their work that they did with that, um, with those recommendations. And we took those rec recommendations and with new information that we receive, received, we've adjusted them a little bit, but then tried to operationalize what those recommendations look like and how we roll that out. But we also want to not be, and I think, you know, CDC has said this, and we've heard it from, you know, the uh, federal government, we have to be careful about being so rigid that, you know, we don't want to, we don't want to throw vaccine away, we want to make sure that we're using it. So, you know, here's the priorities, here's the tiers, you know, make sure we're operating within that. But if you have somebody that's there and you have open vaccine and they're here but maybe a little further down let's not waste it let's get that vaccine allocated and get it you know get another Iowan um, vaccinated so you know everybody's gonna everybody's gonna do their best to do it right we've got a lot of people that are working hard uh, to make sure that we get this rolled out and that we get 
Iowans uh, vaccinated in, in a timely manner. So, you know, there'll be check and balances, but we, we also need to make sure that they know here's kind of the guidelines to operate in. Let's do it as much as we can, but let's not be wasting vaccine either. About testing levels, Governor, I always fallen into the bottom tier of states in terms of the number of COVID tests that are being administered. I didn't catch the first page. Uh, COVID testing levels. Yeah. Uh, Iowa has fallen into the bottom tier of states in terms of the number of tests being administered. What do you... what? reason do you think that might be and are you concerned that Iowa may not be getting an accurate picture of, no, I think of the infection rate? Probably Test Iowa gives us the best accurate um, projections of community spread because you don't have to be symptomatic to go get tested. So right now it's not a resource problem. It's just Iowans getting tested. We've gone through holidays and we've had some bad weather. And so that's impacted some of the numbers. But I think, you know, when we look at that, that's a very good indication of what, you know, actually is happening in communities because anybody can go and it's more reflective of the population. Sometimes too, I don't know which site you're referring to, but sometimes some of them look at individuals tested and some of them look at total tested. And I think we really need to focus on total test again, because that's a more a, a reality of what's actually taking place uh, today when we're looking at a 14 and seven day uh, average. So I think the thing too, that's more that we really need to focus on as we make miss as we make the shift and what we're looking on, looking at, and what we've based a lot of our mitigation efforts on is just hospitalizations. And, and because, you know, who's going in, what do those numbers look like? We were seeing significant impact to our workforce in November, which was really uh, problematic. We had beds, we just had workforce shortages. And so we've continued to see those numbers uh, significantly decrease. Uh, so we're watching those very carefully. We're continuing to reach out to hospitals. We do get a daily report. They still contact them all to make sure that, you know, to get their input on how things are going. But I think the numbers, you know, do speak for themselves. We were at, uh, I think, 15, over 1,500 at mid-November, and we're for 474 right in that ballpark right now. So significant decrease, and we're continuing to see that go down, and we'll continue to watch, watch that carefully. Governor, could you could you talk about the reasoning behind including government officials who work at the Capitol in the tier one one of the one B tiers? Well, so a lot of them will fight. Some of them will hit the sixty five and older. So you're going to see some blend across the different tiers that we have, but there is continuity of government, and so um, that's one of the reasons that we wanted to include uh, them in the tier process that we that we moved through. So that's why they were included in that. Okay, thank you.